Good morning, church. Thank you for being here on this fine, chilly, super chilly Sunday morning. To those worshiping with us at home, for whatever reason, we're glad that you are here with us. And hopefully you stayed on long enough to see that we did get the stream finally up and running. You may have noticed that there are several who are normally here that aren't here. Some may be sick, some may not have wanted to come out uh, with the inclementing weather. Uh, Tommy and his family, they are uh, some that are sick. And I talked to Linda yesterday, um, and it seems like they are on the mend. But what I want you to do is I want you to take uh, just a quick look around, around you. Go ahead, turn your heads. Don't look at me, I'm not that good looking. I lied, I am. Go ahead and look all around you. If you notice someone that's not here, maybe because they are sick, I want you to reach out to them. Don't think that somebody else is going to check in on them. Be that person. And they may very well say, hey, we don't need anything. But I think that as Christians, we ought to look out for one another. So if you noticed somebody who's normally sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you, that's not here, make it part of your mission this week uh, to reach out for them. As we get started this morning, I have a question for you. How many of us would claim to have a mustard seed-sized faith? How many of you would say right now that you have the faith of a mustard, mustard seed? I'm thinking that many of you are like me. That when I ask myself this question, do I have the faith of a mustard seed? I kind of threw my arms up and said, I don't know. Because you see, in Luke, it says that the mustard seed-sized faith, it can say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. In Matthew's version, he says, you can say to this mountain, go and throw yourself from here to there, and the mountain itself will move. Do you have the faith of a mustard seed? I think we need to look a little closer at it to dive into that question, but I wanted to give you a little context as to why I'm preaching on this this morning, and most of what uh, we'll do will come out of Luke 17, so you can turn your Bibles in there. I'll be jumping uh, around. But when I went home for Christmas to visit my family, my dad spoke of this necklace that my grandmother wears, and she was actually able uh, to meet us in Kansas and meet our two youngest ones whom she had not. And guess what was in this necklace that he spoke of? A mustard seed. He shared with us this poem that he had written about this necklace, about his mother, that I would like to share with you just to give a little bit of context. Here's a poem my dad wrote about this necklace. There hanging on the chain was mustard. Not the plant, but the seed. There in the middle of an acrylic ball, the beginnings of the deed. It was simple, a necklace, acrylic, round and clear. What was inside the necklace is what we now hold dear. Mom, she would call us three to the couch, him and his sisters. Come sit here while I read. She would call us to the couch to listen so she could sow the seed. God became real in our hearts real to my sisters and me. Mom kept on reading. It started growing. I mean the seed. That was early on when we would sit still in her lap. But as we grew, our direction changed. To be safe, you would always need a map. From there, our lives got crazy. Careers, family, and such. Mom has always waited quietly, reaching out, staying in touch. Through many twists and many turns, doubt would fill the air. But God's loving hand was constant. Simply, he was always there. Mom, this is where you, having loved God and the Bible you read, because you read scripture, each of us put on Jesus, not the plant, but the seed. Mom, you were always patient, and I know you waited long for us to come back closer to stop from doing wrong. You watched and you waited, and then you waited some more. You gave what you could and Jesus settled our score. 
Mom, I think of that necklace on how faith starts small and it grows. I think of how much you love and how faith has not turned cold. And as time passes, we spend a few more moments here. I pray we will always remember what the thing is that we all hold dear. To that round acrylic necklace with the seed inside, with the seed inside the faith of a mustard seed igniting our lives. May each day from now be forever blessed with the knowledge of the fact that faith with, when birthed gives rest. He wrote that for my grandmother on one of her birthdays, and we'll be coming back to that towards the end of the sermon. You see, but what the disciples did was they asked Jesus a question. They requested of him in verse 5, Lord, increase our faith. Why did the disciples throw up this prayer? I, I really believe that's what it is. Why did the disciples ask Jesus of that? You heard in the scripture reading that Alan did uh, right before that. Woe to the person through whom sin comes. Sin's going to come, but woe to the person in whom it does. And then he goes on to talk about forgiveness, that when a brother comes to repent, what you ought to do is you ought to forgive, not just once, not just twice, but up to seven times. And that's not seven and then done. That's not what he means, but it's forgive abundantly. And the disciples look at Jesus and they say, increase our faith. Not so that they can do miraculous things, not so that they can do great deeds, but so that they can treat one another the way that God has called them to treat, to be forgiven, to be a person who's not a stumbling block. And the disciples, in asking this, it shows the presence of their faith, the imperfection of their faith, and a desire to increase their faith. You see, the question that they have, or the request, I keep saying question, I know there's not a question mark in there, is rooted in humility. Give us faith to do that. To do what? To forgive. To forgive again and again, because sometimes it just is too difficult. Give us the faith to be able to, to do that. I think sometimes when we talk about faith, we think of actions and great things and great mighty works. But here when the disciples were asking, it was rooted in humility so that they could serve one another. When they were asking Jesus to increase their faith, Jesus goes on to tell the story. And I'm going to uh, read it again in verse 7 through 10 of chap chapter 17. Because what Luke did was he gathered information on what the disciples needed to hear. So starting verse 7, will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at my table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare a supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done what you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants, for we only have done that which is our duty. You see, we read of James and John, the situation uh, where they ask Jesus what? Can I sit at your right or can I sit at your left? Every time Peter speaks, what do the disciples do? In a way, they chide him. It seems at times that the disciples are constantly jogging for position. What does Jesus say to increase your faith? You're going to have to let go of prestige. You're going to have to let go of position. It doesn't matter if you are sitting on my right or if you're sitting on my left. It doesn't matter if you're sitting next to me or if you're sitting at the end of the table. Just make it to the table and stay there. Church, if we are going to ask God to increase our faith, our motives must be pure. And no matter how great a thing you might have done or you might do, it is only what you have been commanded and what you have been told to do. It's only what you've been commanded. I'm glad you are sitting in the chairs this morning. 
I'm glad that you're listening to a sermon this morning about Jesus. But it's not a point where you can say, look at me, look at what I have done. Oh, look at me at what I have to say. Look at Chris, he's standing in a pulpit. It doesn't matter. We are simply slaves of the king, and whatever he has commanded of us are the things that we should do. There is no increase to our faith by searching or seeking for prestige. And so if we are going to look and pray to God and say, increase our faith, our motives, first of all, they have to be pure. Because it's not about position. It's not about looking good to others. It's about being faithful. I'm only doing what I've been told. I'm only serving where I think I'm needed. Second question. Can Jesus increase faith? Is Jesus capable? Is he able to answer that and say, yes, I'm going to increase your faith? The answer, of course, is... Yeah, audience participation. The answer, of course, is... Yes. Yes. 100%. And I find it to be a great question by the disciples. Lord, increase our faith. Because there's many instances, if you read through all of the Gospels, if you read through, Jesus rewards someone for their great faith. And he comments on those with such little faith. Right? Do you remember uh, when Jesus uh, met the woman? He answered her, he says, Oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was instantly healed. Oh, you of little faith. So there is this idea that there is little faith and there is great faith. In Paul's writings in 2 Thessalonians, he commends the growing of their faith. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly. And the love of every one of you, the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. You get this idea that there is faith that grows, that you start here and you end, actually hopefully you never end, but it's continually growing. But Jesus doesn't answer it that way. And it's, I'm going to be honest, it's a little frustrating to me because he doesn't actually seem to answer the request or the question that they have Because he indicates it's not about the size of your faith, but rather the object of your faith. It's not about the quantity, but the quality of your faith. Where are you putting your faith into? Which begs us to ask, do I have faith like this? Do I have the faith of a mustard seed? How do I know? What can I look at to say, yes, I think that's where my faith is at. If you look through Luke chapter 17, many commentators will say that this is just a bunch of sayings, uh, important sayings that Jesus had, that Luke put together, that they don't really have much to do with one another. And I think there's some merit to that, but the truth is, I think as Uh, Steve pointed out, Luke was meticulous. He looked into things, and I think that he did intentionally put these stories together for a reason. And I think there's clues that will help us answer the question of, do I have a mustard-sized, mustard-seed-sized faith? The first evidence on if you have a mustard-seed-sized faith is forgiveness is evident in your life. Temptation, or Luke 17, chapter 1. Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. For it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to say, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day, and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, then you ought to, then you must forgive him. If there is ever a time where forgiveness is needed, I think it's now. 
It seems like everywhere we turn, whether it's in the news, the things that we listen to, conversations with friends, it almost seems that everything is meant to cause division among family members. It's meant to cause division uh, and strife in church families. It's meant to cause divisions in the relationships that you have with your friends. And it causes these cracks. And these cracks become holes. And these holes become we never even talk anymore because of X, Y, and Z. I'm sure in the last two years you've had plenty of reasons to not forgive. Forgiveness is the beginning of healing and mending. Don't wait for the other one to come to you. Go to them and offer forgiveness. And if somebody comes to you, you must forgive. If you can have forgiveness in your heart for friends, for family, forgiveness for your enemy, then the seed of faith has potential. You are capable of having a mustard seed sized faith. Clue number two. Humility is present. You don't just offer forgiveness, but you are humble. And I already mentioned it earlier. You consider yourself a servant of the Most High God, and you consider others better than yourself. What does humility look like? Maybe it's you're sitting down to eat a meal after morning worship. A crowd comes in with unruly children, probably my family. They're noisy. And they choose to sit next to you. And kids are knocking food off the table. They're throwing food to one another. They're fighting over crayons. They're fighting over who gets to do what. And the parents whisper to their kids to try to get their attention. But quickly that whispering comes into talking louder. And that talking louder comes in to shouting. And then shouting comes in to threatening. All the while we are trying to have our own lunch. And what do we do? I heard an answer. What did you say? Just, just look. What do we do? Maybe we fold our arms. Maybe not outwardly. Maybe inwardly. We fold our arms. Can those parents not control their children? For I remember a day when. That to me is a lack of humility. Why? Because you choose to look down on somebody else. We don't know why the kids are acting the way that they are. There's lots of reasons for kids not to act the way that they are expected to or the way that they should. But we shouldn't judge parents based off the actions of their young kids. What should be judged? Those who cause little ones to sin. And God says, I'm not going to let them get away with it. When we think about our humility, it has to be in evidence and if you look down at if you've looked down your nose at someone or an attitude or a situation that is political or a situation that is within your family and you have been the one casting haughty eyes looking down then you must repent I won't ask for a show of hands but how many of us would need to repent because we haven't been humble enough And guess what? You will be forgiven. Recently, I've had to do this with several people in this room. Ask for forgiveness because I wasn't humble, because I placed myself on a pedestal, acted in a way that I shouldn't. And in humility, I had to ask for forgiveness. And every single time, Guess what I was met with? Huh? Forgiveness. Not once, not twice, three times. Forgiveness. Why? Because I stepped down and said, hey, I'm sorry for what I have been doing. Key number three. Thankfulness is a state of mind. Look at uh, verse 11 of chapter 
17. On the way to Jerusalem, as Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered the village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to him, rise, go on, your fa- go on your way, for your faith has made you well. The next thing that is in dire need for each one of our hearts is to have thankfulness reside there. If I gave you a list of all the things that God has cured me of through the blood of Jesus, we would be here a while. If I confess to you all the evil, dark thoughts, the dark things that I have done, you would hang your heads in shame that you would even know me. If I was telling you about all the darkness in my life, you may choose to refuse to listen to me. But the reason that you can hear me, the reason that you can listen to me, is because there is nothing and I mean absolutely nothing, that I am more thankful than the blood of Jesus who cleanses me from sin. To have faith the size of a mustard seed, thankfulness is a part of our, thankfulness is a part of our life. Recently, since we just got done with the Christmas season, you may have gotten a gift from somebody, or it's your birthday and Uh, they sent you a card or they sent you a note, and it caused you to be thankful. It caused you to give thanks. That's not the kind of thankfulness that we're looking for. That's not the kind of thankfulness that Jesus is looking for in this passage. Yes, the one turned back and he was thankful, but what was Jesus expecting? That all ten would turn back and glorify God. Church, It is good that someone in our midst has a spirit of thankfulness. But that is not what is required. Jesus says, I require all of you. I expect every one of you to glorify God just like this leper who was a Samaritan. A no good nobody who came back and praised God for what he has done. Your faith has made you well. And I choose to believe that that Samaritan's life, it wasn't just the skin on his outer body, but it was the heart within him was renewed. Why? Because his faith had made him well in more ways than what he was looking for. And he chose to give thanks. How's your thankfulness? At what level are you being thankful to God? You've seen the good, you've seen the great, maybe it's been difficult, or maybe your life has even been unmanageable, but thankfulness, it's up to you. Guess what? The leper in his life was unmanageable until he met Jesus. If your life is still unmanageable and you have met Jesus Maybe take a second look of how your thankfulness is playing a part in it. Because if you are convinced and you are thankful that Jesus has saved you and cast away all darkness inside of your life, it's pretty hard to beat that. It's pretty hard for life to take that away from you. Number four, you understand God's kingdom. Look at verse 20 and 21. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Now there's two ways to look at that passage. The kingdom of God, it's either inside you 
Okay, translators do it both ways. It's either inside you or it's right in front of you in the story. When Jesus said, you don't say here it is or there it is, but it's in your midst, he could have pointed to himself. He could have said, I am the kingdom of God. He could have done that. But I think it's more important to understand. Siri didn't get that. But I think it's, did you get that? Just kidding. But I think it's more important to understand that the kingdom was not something that you could touch, that you could feel, that you could see, that it was something spiritual, that it is something spiritual, something that is not seeable. It's reachable, but not seeable. You see, I think if you're going to have a mustard seed sized faith, you're going to have to be willing to be forgiving to have a spirit of forgiveness. You're going to have to be humble. Humility must be present, and not just present, but seen and understood by others. Your state of mind is one of thankfulness. If you find yourself complaining about situations or find yourself in a quandary of, does God really exist, or what is he doing in my life, examine thankfulness and get through it. But it's not just those three It's understanding, it's understanding God's kingdom and knowing your purpose within it. In order to have a mustard seed sized faith, we must know that we are a part of the kingdom of God. And it's on its way. And just like Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. For he established his kingdom. He has put in place since the day of Pentecost when Peter preached and 3,000 people were baptized that day because they said, I want to be part of this kingdom. For what you are seeing here and hearing now is exactly what Joel and Isaiah and Daniel all prophesied. That in the last days the Lord will pour forth out his spirit and he will put it on mankind. Man, woman, Old, young, big, small, it doesn't matter. For his spirit is available to all. And those who were baptized that day, they wanted purpose in their life to let the kingdom of God become their purpose for living. If the kingdom of God becomes your purpose for living, then you're going to have to change your priorities. It means you're going to have to change your mind about who's in charge It means you're going to have to change your mind on the way that you're going to live the next five minutes or the next day, the next month, year, or decade. If you can put these things together in your life, forgiveness, humility, if you can put those things together in your life, and even if you struggle with every one of them, you are going to have the faith at least the size of, of a mustard seed. It is going to happen. I think when Jesus answered this, when I first started studying, I said, it's kind of a hopeless answer, but I think it's one that gives hope because he was telling them, you can do it now. Your faith can increase if you are in sync with Jesus. If he is Lord and we are his servants. He says, I don't call you slaves anymore, but I call you brothers. It's a deeper relationship than just king and subject. Being in sync with Jesus. If you are in sync with Jesus, the question is, do you love others like Jesus? The ten lepers show up and what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? He approached them. The man who was a stumbling block, even though he might have been a stumbling block, if he asked for forgiveness, he would be forgiven. If you love like Jesus, then the mustard seed faith is in you. Your faith can increase. Your faith can increase if you start small. Church, when you first heard that verse... And the mulberry tree would be uprooted, thrown into another location. What did you think about your faith? 
Were you in despair to a certain level? I think all of you admitted along with me that it's hard to say I have the faith the size of a mustard seed because we've never uprooted a mulberry tree. We've never seen a mountain be moved by the things that we say. So it's hard to say, do I have the faith of a mustard seed? And spiritually speaking, I have called for mountains to be moved. Some of them have moved. Some of them have sat there. My plea for you is start small. Start today. Don't let today go by without getting started. Because here's the rest of the story. The poem I read, it started way, and I'll probably get emotional, I'll try not to. The poem I read, it started way before my grandma asked my dad and his sisters to sit on the couch. It started the day that my dad was born. Without ever mentioning it to my dad, grandma prayed that he would become a preacher. She never told him. She never mentioned it. She never even said anything about it. He had no idea. He didn't live in a church group. He was not gathered up with the church family all his growing up years. They dabbled in church, went to church every once in a while on the holidays. But Grandma prayed. And on the day that my dad graduated from Bear Valley School of Biblical Studies, when the last amen was said at the end of their ceremony, his mom, my grandma, came up to him trembling and said, I need to tell you something. He thought that she was going to congratulate him for finishing something. No, all she wanted to do was to let him know that God has finished something because she had prayed 27 years prior to that day and now it was becoming a reality. May my son be a preacher. Not even a, she wasn't even a churchgoer at the time. She started small. She started with a simple prayer. My dad married my mom, who's one of 13 kids. Six of my mom's brothers preach. My parents found life together, had three boys. Two of us pretend to preach. Two of us preach. Actually, three do, but one does it with his life as a fireman. My dad has grandchildren now. All girls, guess what the prayer for them is? For them to preach? Just kidding. <laughs> it's that they find purpose. That's the prayer for today. That's the prayer for your families, for your own life, is that they find purpose, that they find the heart of forgiveness, that they find the ability to understand God living in them, and eventually that they fulfill their life of Jesus through their own lives, that they understand the kingdom. That is my prayer. That's his prayer. And it all links back to a grandmother who was not part of any church like this, who had no faith background, or what was, was very little. It all links back to a prayer that my grandmother said. She changed our family tree. What's yours? Where are you going to start? Maybe you already have. Knowing some of you, you likely have. But my question is, do you have a mustard seed-sized faith or not? I believe that you do. I believe that we all have that ability. And the mulberry tree that was in my life was uprooted. All of the sin 
was gathered up in one place, and God took it and he threw it away through Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but that is something worth talking about. That is something worth getting excited about. That is something worth being thankful for. That is something, be, that is something to be forgiving of others for. Think about it. Does my life reflect a mustard seed-sized faith? If it doesn't, then start today. And if it does then please continue. Take Luke chapter 17 and make it your situation and let God do His work in you. Be purposeful about it. Be thankful. Be humble. Be forgiven. If there's anyone here who still needs that kind of forgiveness from God through Jesus Christ, in a little bit, we're going to urge you to come forward. We want you to come forward. And the, cre- the request is that when you do, that you are baptized. Why? Because it, is, because it is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have this life. And it is in our enacting that, according to Romans 6, that we go through the death, his burial, and we are raised up in his likeness of his resurrection. That we are no longer to live in sin, but to live for him because whoever we give our bodies to, we are slaves to the one we give it to. And if we give it to Jesus, if you give it to Jesus, you become his slave, his servant. But more than that, you become his brother. Maybe baptism is that step. It's that start so that you can have the faith of a mustard seed. I know for Robin this last Wednesday, that was the step that she took. The faith of a mustard seed exemplified on a Wednesday night through Robin and trusting in Jesus with her life. We all have that opportunity. If there's anything that we can do for you, we urge you to come as we stand and as we sing. I care not today what tomorrow may bring. If shall-